Chris Gardner. So good afternoon, everybody. I think it's afternoon by now. Close enough to count. I'm Chris Gardner. I'm the senior software engineer at TNW Operations down in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, we mostly do DoD contracting, logistics, IT support, uh, custom software development for contracts as necessary, things of that nature. And uh, a couple years ago, we managed to be in the right place at the right time and, and get an exclusive contract to be the North American distributor for these uh, palm readers, which we're going to go into later. And it kind of got me going down the world of biometrics. And three years later, I discovered nobody else knew what I was talking about. So I thought I would tell everybody what I'm talking about. Um, so this is kind of an overview of everything biometrics. Uh, we're going to start, of course, with the boring part, because we have to start with the boring part and go into what biometrics are and some stuff we can do about them. We'll talk about the bio API, which is a common API that Almost every biometric provider uses. It's actually what is at the backbone of the Windows Biometric Foundation if you actually go down into the, the subsystem that low. Uh, and then we get to the exciting part where we play around with all these toys. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So most importantly, what are biometrics? Remember, you can always find a Dilbert that works for a tech talk. Um, <laughs> I mean, well, first of all, there are a way that, that Wally's family found a way to get off the grid, but Wally's a special case, and we know this. But what are they actually? Well, OK, let's go with what the dictionary says. Biometrics, noun, uses a singular verb. It's not that one. It's not that one. It's this one. The process by which a person's unique physical and other traits are detected and recorded by an electronic device or system as a means of confirming identity. Sample sentence, scanning of the human iris is a reliable form of biometrics. Let's talk about that for a second. Reliable? Sure. Safe? Secure? Not so much. Hey, they're a dictionary. They're not tech people, right? So what are some types of biometrics that you guys have heard about? Palm readers. Palm readers. Well, of course. There's one right there. Right, right, right. I've only got three of them here. Facial recognition, that's a good one. Any other? Yep, fingerprint. Blood vessels. Blood, well, that's basically what the vein's doing. So, yeah, the palm readers. Yeah. Uh, voice recognition. Voice recognition, that's in there. Yep. Just an article about um, recognizing your heart rhythm. Yep, that could be one, too. We'll slightly get into that here in a little bit. But so when you're talking about types of biometrics, you've got fingerprints, you've got palm scanners, retina scanners, iris scanners, facial recognition, speech recognition, handwriting recognition. Anything you can think of, we can recognize it. There's actually a DARPA contract out right now for if somebody can do a DNA analysis and find a match in like biometrics time, aka like half a, you know, half a second, which I find is funny because of what you actually have to do to do a DNA analysis. But hey, if you think you can analyze DNA in under a second, there's about five million for you out there in DARPA funding. Go get it. Yeah, that's the point right there. So um, let's break all these down into separate types. So there are your optical ones, like fingerprints, iris scanners, facial recognition, handwriting recognition. These all basically are doing some sort of optical image analysis by just looking at things. Okay. There's vein pattern, which are palm scanners and retina scanners. Uh, it actually just came out that I think it's. Toshiba actually now has a vein fingerprint reader where it's like the, the palm readers, except for they're actually measuring the veins and not your actual fingerprint in your finger. So those need to be added this soon. And then there are other things like speech recognition and handwriting recognition. And anybody figure out why handwriting recognition is in there twice? Cursive. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Your, your heart's in the right place saying that. So, Standard optical handwriting recognition just looks at the actual thing and makes sure that it matches what their template is. So any sufficiently talented forger can just replicate your signature, and it would fool the system. Uh, if you ever go to places where you have to sign for your credit card on a pressure pad, that's actually seeing how hard you put emphasis on certain parts of your name while you sign it and uses that as a second factor. So it's slightly more secure. Um, that's only if you're doing it on a pressure pad, though. I cannot make my name look like my signature look like it should. That is my job goal. I didn't say anybody was actually using it very effectively right now, but that's, that, that is a second factor that people are looking at. The problem is, like you say, it's, it's that weird angle at that screen where you're trying to just scribble something and it never comes out right. So, but they actually are working on making a more secure version that actually sees how you write it, not just that you wrote it. 
As far as I know, it's just pressure, but I guess they could do timing as well. Getting ideas for algorithms in my head, excuse me for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Writing code. OK. So some of the things you need to look for when you're analyzing a biometric device. First, they're the two most important numbers you're going to come across. And these are the old school names, but they are more readily accessible than the new ones, which is the false accept rate, which is how often a person who should not have access is given access. That number is bad. You want it to be really, 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 really low, or else you're just going to let everybody into your secure area. There's also the false reject rate, which is how often someone who is allowed in is denied access. Sure, you want this one low as well, but that's just annoying because they may have to rescan to gain access. So th this is not your security violation. This one is your security violation. Now, the other thing you need to worry about, which is a lot more security related, is how is the data acquired? So remember when I said things like iris scanners aren't very reliable? Because a sufficiently high resolution picture will fool that device. It's just taking a camera and doing an image comparison, basically. So you do have to worry about what the type of data it's collecting is and how easily you can fool it. Um, the other thing you need to worry about is how is the data transmitted. Uh, this thing right here, the fingerprint scanner I'm using, is just a network device. If someone can gain access to your network, sniff out a packet and retransmit it, it kind of defeats the whole purpose. So you want to make sure that, and, and yes, I've put Fiddler on a network and tried to retransmit a packet, and that thing passes that test. But these are the type of considerations you need to worry about. Can somebody inject in a false without ever actually going through the reader? So why do we bring all this up? Right? Because there are levels of security. Security is not convenient, ever. This little fingerprint reader on my laptop is really convenient, really easy to get around. Same thing with your iPhone. Hackers got through that thing in about five minutes. There's a video on YouTube of a guy getting past the actual thing in one minute. So he goes and rolls his finger, sets that finger down, picks up a piece of tape, transfers it, uses a different finger, scans it. That fast. Okay? It's convenient. It's not secure. If you want security, think two or three factor. We were actually asked by an uh, agency to set up a secure area. We have a biometric scanner. We have a prox card. And you have to pin in. So something you are, something you have, something you know. Three-factor security. Think of your biometrics and secure parlance as a username, not a password. And use something else as an authenticating factor. Any questions? So. What can we do with these things? I'm sure we would all love the eye scanner to, to eventually exist, especially those uh, single people still going to bars. Uh, maybe we'll get there one day. I'm working on it. But what's the most obvious thing you're going to do with a biometric? You mean other than identify someone? Right. Well, that's, that's what it does. What are you going to do once you identify somebody? Let them do stuff. Access control. It's your most obvious answer. So this is, at our old office, the actual palm scanner we used to have on our server room door. Um, and I used this because this was our first attempt at wiring up a door, and it's so beautifully janky and, and like invisible man-ish. So that's why I still use these pictures. But as you see here, we had a palm scanner that they would use that the people who had access to the server room could actually buzz in. We actually had a cipher lock on the door, too, so we had a second form of authentication. You actually had to get past that deadbolt and then scan in. Once you came inside, there was the breakout that went to the door striker, and then it actually then followed through and actually would log who actually opened it in. That door striker was really loud. It would go bzzz when it let the person in. So we used to refer to anybody that had access to the server room as buzzards because <laughs> we're cynical like that. Um, but that's just a, a very simple system to actually just do a feedback. They had to get in the building, so we didn't worry about too much password or whatnot. We did put the cipher lock on there, but let's admit it, we're lazy IT people. so. The first guy to walk in at 7 in the morning would unlock that thing, and then it was on the security checklist to remember to relock it at the end of the day. These things happen. You're only as secure as you make it. Of course, when you start talking about this, viruses on your server room have a completely different meaning. But that's OK. <laughs> so other forms of access control. That door setup was fine, but what if you wanted something a little more portable? So this actually exists. So the, the guys at ID Air, which are the people who make the fingerprint scanner I'm using, actually have a version for Android, certain Android phones and iPhone, where it will take a picture of your finger, 
use that image analysis to uh, verify that it's you, and then it will either through NFC or Bluetooth send a signal somewhere to unlock a door completely wirelessly. Because Bluetooth has never been hacked, ever. Just saying. But it, it works really well. Um, because phones these days have really high resolution cameras where you can really get in there and see everything. Yes, Dan? Why don't you just use the identifier of the NFC on the phone? Like have it send a good each time thing, who I am. Instead of because what happens when somebody steals your phone and you just walks in? Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's what makes it the second part of the authentication. Of course, you're just taking a picture, so why can't I just take a picture of a picture at that point? We're not going to really analyze the security implications of that thing. That's more of a consumer level where you just want to make it more, more or less annoying. Um, of course, since biometric should be a username, not a password, you could also use it for user authentication. Uh, I actually have one of those at my desk at work. Don't use it very often, but I have it because the mouse itself is not a very good mouse. But it wasn't made to be a mouse. It was made to host that palm scanner. And the little guide there helps you enroll correctly. And then once you get used to it, you can just kind of stop your hand for half a second on the way down to grabbing it. It'll grab it, do the authentication, unlock your computer, and you're just ready to go. Uh, we were trying to get that sold to doctor's offices so that the doctors didn't necessarily have to touch anything so they could move around stuff. Uh, but then we discovered there's this wonderful thing called HIPAA, and doctors don't trust any computer person. Go figure. So now we get to get to the fun parts. So at, I think it was 2003, it doesn't say there, uh, Ford showed off a concept card that actually had biometrics built into it. So if you look here, there are two little pressure plates on the steering wheel where you hold it that was getting things like pulse rate and things like that. And then the lap band itself had some sensors in it that were getting similar type of information. And it was trying to measure your relative stress level or alertness through these biometrics so that the car could respond to you. If it noticed you were getting drowsy and your heart rates and everything were dropping, it could turn the stereo up, make a, a buzzer alarm, turn on certain active lane keeping features and things like that. If it detected you were too high stressed, so you were getting uh, road raged out, then it could make other factors to attempt to make it to attempt to make the car safer to run things like this uh, it is a concept car because if you think about the car trying to take over your driving ability that could be bad because what happens when you're about to get in a wreck and your stress shoots way up and all of a sudden your car fights you <laughs> they're still working on it but it's a great concept to actually take this data and actually use it to help make things more safe and more available of course our friends in japan can't be outdone oh no they can't so they created a car seat that identifies you with your uh, butt print. <laughs> so they put 360 sensors down in the actual seat of the car. And when you sat down, it used the pressure mapping of each one to make sure that the person sitting down is the person they thought was sitting down. And the car would only turn on if it was a match. They got a 98% accuracy out of this thing, which is actually pretty good, of course. That 2% when you can't turn your car on because you had a big meal? Yeah, about that. But there, there's another version of where we can take this stuff and actually make more creative arrangements with it. Please tell me that my comb has a butt reader. <laughs> they didn't actually give it, a, they just said pressure sensors. They didn't actually name it. Yeah. That's right. So let's talk about the actual bio API right now. So we're going to quickly go into the history because this stuff has actually been around for a long time, just nobody was using it as far as the idea of an API went. So the actual first version of a standardized API was in 97 with the human authentication API. Uh, shortly thereafter, the bio API consortium was formed and they merged together with the human authentication. API, and they released a version 1 in 2000. Yay, version 1. And of course, as soon as they released that, they went, well, we messed a few things up, because that's what you do when you release an API. And so then they released a 1.1 the year after, and it became an ANSI standard. American standard, ANSI, we have a standardized 1.1. When we look at the demos with the palm scanners, they're actually all using the bio API version 1.1 uh, setup 
So you'll actually be able to see what one of those looks like when we get there. Shortly after they made that an ANSI standard, they got together with the guys at ISO, and in 2006 they made a full-blown worldwide ISO standard, passed it off to the ISO committee, and then backed away, and nobody's really heard from the Bio API Consortium ever since. At 2.0, it is an actual ISO standard. It's, if you actually buy the standard, it's in four volumes, and the one you care about is 167 pages of really poorly documented API. Have any of you ever read an ISO standard before? You, you have my condolences. Yeah. So, and then now they're looking at what they did in the, in the 2.0, and they're actually working on a 2.1. If you actually go and search the ISO website, you can see that there is a draft paper out, but they're not releasing that draft yet because it's so beta. It's just probably alpha, I think, would be the correct term for it. But it is out there. They are working, currently working on a new version to update some of the things they messed up in 2.0. So what is it really? The API is a standardized collection of functions that basically says, if we have a biometric device, what are the things we're always going to want to do with them? We're always going to want to enroll people or capture their identity. We're always going to want to identify people or verify that that's the person it is. So basically, the Bio API in the 1.1 version is, I believe, 17 functions. In 2.0, they went up to about 30 functions because of some separation of concerns they worked with, which is their attempt at saying, if you have one of these authentication devices, this is everything you're ever going to want to do with it. Do you think they got everything? No, of course not. But it's a really good standardized for most things. So the version 1 was an ANSI standard. Version 2 went up to ISO. Basically what version 2 did is version 1, everything was in one namespace. So all your database management, all your dealing with the actual sensor, all your overhead for startup and teardown, that were, they were all in the same namespace, same API. It was the consistent 17-ish functions. Uh, in 2.0, they said, well, you might want to do all your database management on a server, so that part was broken out. And then the part that actually deals with the hardware is different. So they just kind of spread things out so that you could have a better separation of concerns. Any questions about the Bio API? Okay. Does it have extension points? Like if you're doing proprietary hardware development, you want to extend the Bio API? To yes. The yes, it does. Um, the, the actual spec for, let's say, a piece of hardware has a, I'm trying to remember, it's, a, it's like a biometric sensor provider, a BSP. And you have to use those functions, but when it passes it to you, it actually passes you whatever you tell it. And so it would just send your extensions with it. Good question. So before we get to the fun part, we have to have one little side trip. We have to appease the lawyers. And the reason being is because one of these demos uses this lovely Connect2, which technically the uh, SDK is still in beta. It is a public beta now. I'm not using the private beta anymore. But Microsoft says that you have to say, this is preliminary software and or hardware, and the APIs are preliminary and subject to change. They didn't say I couldn't put a cute otter picture on the <laughs> slide. So at least we can like temper the legal ease a little bit. All right? So want to have fun with the toys now? Yeah. Let's have fun with the toys. All right. So the first thing we're going to do since you, tell, I, since you can tell I love that thing so much, is we are going to play around with one of these palm scanners. So this is the entire piece of hardware. Let's make sure the camera gets it real quick. That little guy right there, he's about one inch by one inch by just under an inch square cube. It's the entire thing with just a standard USB 2 cord. This is the one I keep in my backpack so I can work on stuff on the road and not have to have the big bulky things. And with enough practice, yes, you can authenticate on this thing. But you have to have been using it for years and know exactly how to hold your hand. Yes, it's USB powered. So five volts. And the way it, the way it works is basically it shoots uh, infrared light up into your hand, which reacts with the hemoglobin in your veins. And then it uses that infrared to, to match the pattern. That's where it's actually collecting the data. So it's actually, act, it's actually basically magnetizing your hemoglobin and then looking for the magnetic trace. Cool, huh? So I've been using it for years, and I'm still OK, right? <laughs> I actually, I've never had a problem with any of these biometric scanners. We did a lot of stuff with RFID several years ago, and I actually had one of the, the interrogators and, and transmitters that's sitting in my office pointing at me 
before I learned to turn it off and turn it back on when I was using it and it was just blasting me for eight hours a day, I would get headaches every day. So RFID will mess you up. But these I've had no problem with ever. So for this demo, if I can get it from Dan's laptop, we're going to use this. And we're now in the audience participation portion. Um, I'm going to have people come up and prove that these aren't rigged demos and it's just me working. Uh, I will not take any of your bank financial information until after I get back home. So you're good for this week. Hopefully you get paid on Friday so it's a better payout for me, right? Good. So this is going to be done with this palm scanner right here. But we're going to go through this code real quick. And I forgot that PowerPoint likes to unmirror the slides. So give me one second. Mirror the displays. So yes, the new version of PowerPoint likes to uh, change your screen display settings when you actually start a presentation. So let's go through this thing a little bit. Hopefully everybody can actually see that code up here. We've got some standard stuff at the beginning that we're just going to ignore. The uh, module GUID right there is just the device identifier for a Palm Secure Scanner. It's basically so it can do an IN none call into the, into the uh, DLL. And then we've got this default callback state callback. What I'm doing is, as we're actually doing a scan, the system will send back callback events saying, hey, here's an idea of what I need you to do next. Well, we can glance at it real quick, but I'm only capturing some of them. But I can say, hey, when I get this message, which is a 203000, then I can say, hey, this is what I need to display to the screen so that people know what's going on. I'm only capturing about five of them for this demo. I think there's something like 50 that actively get returned. And it's down to the, hey, you're slightly off center. Move your hand a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. You're pitched, you're yawed. It, it'll actually tell you exactly how you need to correct your whatever you're scanning to make sure you get a consistent response. But here's the part we actually care about. So the way these things read when we're coming in through here is that if you see any of these that say PV API, that's where Fujitsu had to do an extension because the actual bio API didn't give them enough flexibility to do something. Any of these that say DNet bio API, that is an actual bio API function in full glory. Now, what happens when you make functions that are meant to work with any device that could ever be created ever? Well, huge functions. Because the problem is, as you see here, for module attach, and we'll go into what all these are, is I have all these null and zeroed out things because nobody cares about those values. But they have to be there because certain devices may want to use them, whereas other ones don't. So as we go through here, you're going to see some things that have upwards of like 17 parameters, and half of them are stubbed out. Welcome to using ISO specs. That's why you got my condolences for having to read one before. So the reason I do like this example, though, is this is a true bio API in its full glory. We're going to go through it. Just about everything will use this, except for the fact when we go into the other devices which aren't using it. But you'll see that they have the same basic structure. So even though ID Air didn't use the bio API for their SDK, it looks a lot like it, a whole lot. So the first thing we do right here is we do an app authenticate. That's me telling the SDK for the Palm driver that I am licensed to actually use it. If you notice, I'm just hiding my license key from you so that you can't just steal it and start pretending you're me. And then we get this first guy right here, which is module load. Basically, what all I'm doing is I'm telling the system, load the DLL and get ready. So there's no magic hardware here. Module attach is then me saying, hey, that DLL I just loaded, attach him to this specific piece of hardware. If you actually go into these functions somewhere, uh, there is a place where I can actually specify a specific scanner if I have multiple hooked up to the computer. I think I can have eight simultaneously, but don't quote me on that. Uh, where you can actually say, here's the, here's the serial number and part number of the specific scanner I want, and it will initialize just the correct one. So that's why that has so many parameters. And then I set up that callback from above so that I can actually get our data. So the next thing I need to do is I need to enroll somebody. And there's two ways we do that. We can have a brave volunteer that will come up here and we can enroll them. I'm unemployed, so I'll volunteer. 
well, let, let's wait until we run the program. I'm still going through the code. Um, but we're actually going to enroll the person. And when you enroll somebody, they actually have to do two hits. So the first time, you're just going to put your hand down, and it's going to actually do a scan. And then it's going to immediately try to re-authenticate you to make sure that it was a good scan. And then it says, hey, you have it. So this guy is going to come through here. With enroll, we're going to say, we need you to use that device. This is for verifying, eventually. And then there is a bunch of stuff, including my ever so favorite reference variable throwaway. Because in C++, you can just pass in references to null, and it's happy. But uh, .NET really doesn't like it when you give a null to a value type. Don't worry, we're going to have more fun with this guy later, as you can see. So what it's going to return is a handle to a place in memory where the biometric results are. And it's a structure called a BIR, biometric information record. And it's got a very fixed structure. And it's this number of bytes in the header and all this other information, which if you ever have to actually touch a BIR manually, you will become intimately familiar with. I'm just kind of hiding it in the background and using the whole thing as one, because just give me a 3K byte string and I'm happy, right? More nodding. We're, we're happy. We're not. All right. As the recruiters in the back uh, heads are spinning. So once we actually get it, I need to actually pull it out of the handle and so I have the actual burr. It says it is an input burr where I actually have the burr. It's really just a byte array with very specific byte packing. So I create this guy called an input burr, which is saying, I now have this biometric record, and I want to do something with it. So all I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I'm giving you the full thing. Here it is. Specs, right? Set up a bunch of variables that we're going to need later. And then I come through. And here's where I actually do the verify. So I'm going to take that information from the enrollment. And we're going to come in here, and we're going to say, grab somebody else's data and see if it matches the one you already had. Now this is a fun function. So we have to pass in lots of stuff. So there's the handle to the device. And then we've got a throwaway reference variable. And then we've got a reference variable to uh, how secure we want it to be. So do we want it to be really highly matched, or can you be a little loose about it? That's what the FRR is asking for right there. And then we have a reference to false. Let's think about this for a second. <laughs> Does anybody know why we might have a reference to false? And what computer language is to blame? C, because old school C didn't have a bool. It's their fault. Anytime you see something that says false equals 0, it's C's fault. All right, then we pass in our input ver, and then we have another reference variable we're going to throw away. Hey, it's the same one. Did you know that you can, if you don't care about the value, you can use the same reference variable over and over again? So we don't care which one is the last one to get overwrote. Anyways, then we get our result, our score. The result says, yeah, it was a match, or boo, it wasn't a match. The score it gives you a percentage. At least it wants to be a percentage when it grows up. Uh, it gives you a value between 0 and 1,000 in increments of 100, instead of 0 to 100 in increments of 10. So hey, let's think about that for a second. And then more throwaway values, right? But once we have that, all we have to do then is check to see if our result was true or false. If it was false, we say it was rejected. If it was true, we say it was verified. Continue our loop until somebody hits escape. Free the memory from the enrollment data. Detach the device from the API and close out the API. Simple, right? Anyone can do that if you want to read really thick, heady standard stocks, right? So do we think this thing will work? Yeah. Woohoo, we have confidence. <laughs> so let's run this guy. Now we'll borrow you. So My as we see, that's right. Pick whichever hand you want. Basically, you just want to make sure your wrist is, is right there on the wrist part. And just hold still. Move your hand away and put it back. Same place. All right, so now we have you enroll. And we should be able to see that if I put my hand there, I was rejected. Aw, because I'm not you. Put your hand back. And that fast you're verified. 
the read time on this thing is about a quarter of a second. And since I'm only going against the Verify on one template, it's about a tenth of a second to do the Verify. So this thing is lightning fast. Yes? You're doing the Verify on the device or on the processor? It's doing it on the processor. So it's just taking those two and then using their proprietary function in the background. So everybody impressed? Woohoo! So now we need to change USB plugs real quick because that's cool and all, right? We think that's cool? Please tell me it's cool. I need validation. <laughs> all right. Well, that's nifty because I had a nice command line prompt where I could look at things and all these other things. Well, what happens if you don't have an interface? Ugh. So we have this guy. And I have a nice long cord so we can really play around with them. What happened was we were actually contacted by a local school system to deal with figuring out when and where their kids were getting on and off the buses. Because they were tired of getting called by angry parents saying that they didn't drop off their kid when the kid just got off two stops earlier to go to Johnny's house. So we came up with this guy. The problem was is we had this nice, beautiful interface that would actually show you exactly who was on and off the bus at all points in time and do all sorts of route guidance. And then the Department of, of uh, Education at the state level said, there's no way you're putting a screen on my bus that will distract my bus driver. Oh. So we came up with this thing. It's got our sensor here in the middle, right? Got these LED light strips around it. Got a, this is, this is the actual production unit, so it doesn't have a Netduino, sorry. The beta unit that I used to carry actually had a Netduino in it uh, to power the light bar and everything. There is a speaker, so we could do sound prompts and everything. And so what would happen is this would actually be on the bus lit up. When the kid would come by, they just had to place their hand in place, and it would see them, cash up, go send to the cloud that, hey, at this time we found this kid at this place marry it up to GPS coordinates to where bus stops were, and they could get the full-blown report of every place a kid has ever gotten on or off the bus. It even did some other special things. I would show you the code for this, but it's got some, I, I, I've been lazy and haven't cleaned it up. And by that, I mean that this is still code we use in other places, and it's got all the cryptography keys hard-coded into it at the moment. So no, you can't see it. So, but when we start this guy, remember, we weren't allowed to have an interface, so I just killed the interface because it wasn't connected to a string anyways. But now we have these nice blue lights. Ooh. They're blue because that makes it look all futuristic, right? All your Tron fantasies come back to life, and you're like. <laughs> so this lets you know that it was on and ready to scan. And if a child came through and scanned that fast, this is a cooked demo, sorry, um, it would go green saying, I knew who you are. I've recognized your information. I've submitted it to the cloud. You may get on or off the bus now. You have been tracked. Somebody else could do it. I need to borrow you. And he's going to take a few more seconds to actually go. He's going to go red because he has no clue who he is in, in the database. Sorry, you can't get on the bus. <laughs> These things happen, right? Um, but one of the other requirements we had was that we couldn't just universally say, I know who you are. They said, well, sometimes kids are bad. Anyone with kids? Sorry, your kid is bad occasionally. <laughs> I have kids, they're really bad. So occasionally a kid would get suspended from the bus for a period of time. So this thing will actually look through and say, hey, I know who you are, you can't come in here. Because you were suspended and then would automatically unlock them after however many days. So we had to get creative with this light bar to actually do all sorts of status lights. But here's where you can actually start really playing around with the possibility of biometrics and thinking more than just letting them authenticate. We're actually tracking that data and, you know, Internet of Things, I tracked people. Ha! <laughs> Beat that one! Anybody else want to try to scan themselves? You'll just go red. It's OK. The reason it was a longer delay is because I actually scanned three times before I said I didn't know who you were. The problem we had is that the kids weren't as sure about themselves as I was. I can slam my hand down there and get a green every time because I've been using this thing forever. They would just always go, eh. Um, eh. So that's why it would scan a couple times before it would say, I have no clue who you are, to give them time to actually do something. Did you get them to scan both hands? Yeah, we enrolled both hands. So that, because it made sense, here was the thing was, when they got on the bus, this was the one that made sense. When they got off the bus, this was the one that made sense. So we did scan both hands. Um, and this palm scanner actually only looks for unique vein signatures. 
So we didn't ever actually get that far for the test, but they did have for some of the special needs bus and palsy kids that couldn't easily do that. So we just scanned the back of their hand so that all they had to do was that, and it worked just fine. Because all they're looking is for that unique vein signature, and as long as it's in the same area consistently, it doesn't matter. So they wouldn't let you put a screen on the box, but that had to be hooked up to... They was hooked up to a computer. Hooked up to a computer? On a box? Yep. Um, yes, the, the actual, and now we're talking about this, the specifics of this device, but the, uh, the actual vein signature through their research actually solidifies and sets uh, at a very young age, somewhere around age five or so. It's actually set in stone. However, because as kids grow and et cetera, et cetera, they actually recommend if you're dealing with kids, you re-enroll them every year. But you could basically get them when they enrolled for school and then they were good for that year, and then when they came back next year to enroll for the next grade, because in Huntsville you actually have to re-enroll every year, they just, during the enrollment, they just would rescan people. So that beats. <laughs> any, any, you want to know what the best concentration is? Actually, the two best concentrations, but we'll go into why one's a bad idea. Right there. That's actually the best one. The problem is, is it's really hard to get an alignment on that consistently. Uh, the second best is the blood vessels in the back of your eye. So guess what that is? That's what a retina scanner is. What's the problem with the retina scanner? No. <laughs> so, so it does the exact same thing that the, uh, that the, that the uh, hand scanner is doing. The problem is, is that those blood vessels are so small, they will actually minorly change based on changes in blood pressure and things like that. So, there was an incident we heard about where in the Pentagon somewhere, a general had a retina scanner put into a meeting room or, or wherever his cure area was, and it worked great until one day he was running late for a meeting because when he enrolled, he was nice and at rest. Well, he went for a jog, just came back, was all nice and, and hot and sweaty, had to run back up to get to this meeting, went to go eye in, and from the fact that he had just worked out, the pressure from his blood pressure raising from working out had changed it and he couldn't authenticate in. At which place that thing was taken out like two days later, I think. Um, and they've also done research that says with the current way they do the technology, women have a lot of problems having a consistent scan. Why? Yes. That's all we need to say about that. Because that causes a significant enough change in their blood pressure and levels that it actually changed in that signature. The other problem is, is that when women get pregnant, that completely changes it all too. So that, that's some of the problems with using those blood vessels uh, for retina scanners. Retina scanner works great if you're in that ideal circumstance. What's for the palm, what's the range? Uh, I have to be two inches away to get a good read. Can you be a foot away, or you got a very narrow band? Got a very narrow band. That's actually the why this thing was constructed in the way it is. It forces all the correct distances and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other problem is, is how is that thing working? If you remember earlier. I'll give you a hint. That's why those windows closed. Infrared light. So if that thing gets sun washed, it completely throws it off. Also, when we get to the connect, it's doing depth sensing. Infrared light, where it's, where it's using infrared to get the distances, have a Sunlight coming in or backlit light completely throws everything off. How, how would you do that in a bus that can see your windows? That's why the scanner is completely enclosed in this black plastic thing. This, this design was actually made to accommodate do you for that. Need to plug that in to the nope, because once they put their hand on it, they closed the, the system. They covered the hole, and it doesn't need any light to work. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> What microcontroller are you using? In, um, did you write that in C or what's it? Uh, the original beta unit was done with an Arduino, just using C sharp. Uh, when we went into production, just for the cost and size and whatnot, we switched to a, a, a board called a Teensy Duino, I believe, uh, which is an Arduino with a built-in uh, TFT to serial or USB to TFT adapter that all powers through one thing. So it's a little board. It's, it's basically that board right there, which we'll get to in the next demo, if I took the rubber band off. Um, 
So do you have two USB connections for that device? There is a hub in there, yeah. That was the other reason of, of the, the, the little small board on top right there. Get in the camera real quick. It's called a Teensy Duino. Um, it is a full-blown Arduino with a lot of the actual extra ports removed and just for serial in and out. So it, it doesn't have the full, what is it, D1 through 15 or D0 through 15 and analog go through 6. There's only a few channels, but it's also like 12 bucks, which is a lot better than putting a what, 60, 50, 60 buck Arduino in every one, which is huge. So that's why we switched to those. Um, yeah, inside that thing there is a USB hub, which is how we only have one wire coming out. And then that goes out, one goes to the Teensy, one goes to the Palm Scanner, and then the Teensy is actually powering the LED light array, which is the exact same, which is the exact same as this. How much do you sell this whole thing for? Or do you sell it as like the whole solution? We sold it as a whole solution. I think the actual sensor unit itself was when we originally did, I think it was 750, but I think we found a way to, to cut costs with that. But that includes the sensor, the entire wiring of it all, everything built into it, the LED strip. I think we actually were trying to get it down cheaper, uh, but I don't remember because I'm not the marketing guy for it. Sorry. But and, and then, then when we sold it, and with the computer that was ruggedized to go in the bus with it, it was like two grand for everything. So that was the computer that ran off the battery, turned on. Whole nine yards. The sensor, not really. Um, the computer does. Because what happens when you take a diesel engine and you put a computer on it? Components start wiggling out. Yeah, that too. So that was the main reason for that. All right. Well, let's play around with fingerprint with fingerprint scanners, shall we? So. For all you .NET people, I'm going to apologize in advance. We're about to look at some C++. <sighs> It'll be OK, I promise. Well, they, they, the, the idea of the guys who make these fingerprint scanners have two versions of the SDK available. One's in C++ because they figure that can go anywhere, and one's in Java because they figure they, that can go anywhere. But uh, I do this in my free time, and you can't pay me to write Java. So you get to look at C++. Um, I'm actually supposed to be helping them make a .NET conversion here soon. Uh, they're just waiting for their funding to come so that they can contract me so I can write the wrapper, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, they haven't had enough interest yet to actually do it. So here is your ugly C++. Yay. OK, we're not going to go as in depth in this one. The main reason I wanted to show you the code is because this is, as you can see, not using the Bio API. Mm-hmm. Yet we're doing the exact same stuff. So we're going to kind of just quickly go through it so that you can see what's going on. So the first thing we do here is this call to ID Air license where I get my license and make sure it's the same. That's like that embedded one for the Fujitsu where I got my license, made sure it was valid. And then we call the one pit locator service and start it. So what did I do right there? That was the same as the load and the, uh, what is it, load and Ver not verify, the, where I loaded the SDK and I attached it to the device. Can't remember the name of the function off the top of my head. So that's where I'm doing the exact same thing right there. This COM port, ignore. That has to do with connecting to this thing so that I can show you statuses. We then sit here and we say find the device and pair. So that we did our module load and then we did our, our module enroll. Once we successfully find it, I sit here and I wait to get a fingerprint template image. Sounds like an enroll, doesn't it? Uh-huh. I then go into this loop where I say, give me another fingerprint. Sounds, once I have the fingerprint, I, do, I go into their matcher and I do the match, and I verify the match between the two fingerprints. Sounds a lot like the verify I did earlier. If they're a match, then I send a value out to the COM port so I can make it light up and everything. And there's this weird stuff with the set hand point. I, I figured if I made you look at C++, I would actually color the text in the command prompt, be a little nicer about it. So that's what all that strange set console text stuff is. But we're going to loop through forever the same we did before until somebody hits escape. And then we're going to close our COM port, unpair the device, module unload, stop, detach, 
And then that's where I just have my default exception handler. So different device, they independently developed the SDK, not even knowing about the Bio API at the time. They created the same thing. That's why the API was written the way it was. But notice now we don't have 10 million parameters we don't care about. Yeah, about that. So do we think it'll work? Yay. OK. I'm going to warn you before I hit start, this thing's loud. One of the first, when they gave it to me, the first thing I said was that, yeah, that buzzing and beeping it does, knock it off. They were like, yeah, we need to make that a setting. <laughs> so there it went. It found the device. It's waiting for a fingerprint template. All right. And now we're talking fingerprints. Who really? All right. So fingerprint up. Just push it on the bottom all the way until you hit the back. And hold still. It found you. So we have a template. Now use that same finger, push it all the way back. Yeah, make sure you're There we go. <laughs> and it didn't match. It doesn't think you were you. Hold if I hit the button first. Oh, you had a bad scan. All right. Let's try this again. There's me. There's a match. And see, all right. So now we get to have the fun part. So try this again. Because let's say this is hooked to the front door of my house, right? Go ahead and. It does not like flat. It does not like your finger. <laughs> Give it a second, and that should go red because, hey, I don't know who you are. Now, if you notice also in here, there's a little servo. It's because when I'm not traveling 450 miles away, um, we actually have a full blown little dollhouse with like a little servo that will open the door and close it. And yeah, it doesn't like long road trips. Um, as you see, this thing that has been in my bag from traveling has really been taped back together many times. <laughs> right, but that's why there's that little servo in there. Because once you've captured the data, you can do whatever you want with it. So the servo is actually in there just to make sure that the program on the TNZ still works because it's actually there. And if I scan, was it this finger or was it the other one? It was that one. Then it goes green and would have opened. Cool. And for some reason, it doesn't like your finger. Sorry. <laughs> um, this thing is actually pretty nifty in the fact that uh, when you do the enrollment, it, you can actually enroll a finger multiple times, and it will lay the images on top of each other intelligently, which of course now you're going, why would I want to do that? Right? Somebody's thinking that, right? OK, good. We got a sure. Uh, the reason being is because, as we saw from, what was your name again? Yeah. From, from Beth's attempt, she got an enrollment, but then she couldn't get a rescan. So what we can do is we can scan her finger this way, and slightly yawed right, and slightly yawed left, and a little bit of an angle right, and a little bit of an angle left, and kind of overlay those so that when she does, she doesn't have to be perfectly aligned every time. <coughs> the problem with this, <coughs> he's using images. The actual thing for the fingerprint, if you save it to disk, guess what the file format is? PNG. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and it can be the straight picture it saw, or it can be pre-processed down to where it's gone to a black and white gradient, and it just has the, you know, as much as possible. But a single fingerprint, which their, all their processing and data has, is about 2 megs, as opposed to about 2K for the palm. Now, if I'm going to layer five fingerprints on top of that one template, we now have a 10 meg template. Space considerations much? Yeah. Actually, it's not the access time, because I'll have it all on RAM anyways. It's the uh, making sure you have enough RAM to do it. Yeah. 
What's the response of big data? You can call it big data if it doesn't fit into RAM. Got 12 gigs there. I think I can get a couple fingerprint templates in there. We're good. Um, the, the, the computer we had on the bus, let's see here, we had 25,000 students enrolled, two prints per student, so now we're talking 50,000 templates, plus a few administrators and whatnot. So we had 50,000 templates on there at upwards of 3K a piece. So now we're up to, what, 150K? No, I missed a decimal point there, but you get the idea. Uh, I, think it, I think it ended up, we got the entire database into two gigs of RAM, and we just held the entire thing in RAM. So when the program started, it just pulled the entire database and threw it, threw it in RAM so I could do comparisons really fast. And that was with 250,000 enrolled people. I'm sorry, 25,000 enrolled people. Math is hard, yo. <laughs> All right, shall we play around with the Kinect? Yeah. So what do you think I'm going to do with this Kinect? No, that's if I brought the RFID yeah, scanners. Your phone, right. <laughs> hmm? Measure your, your phone. Well, see, you know this. <laughs> He's seen the presentation before. You think I'm going to do facial recognition, right? That's what you think I'm going to do. But I'm not going to do facial recognition, and I will tell you why, and I have two reasons. One, because all of you without having this connect, can go do facial recognition yourself. There's a library for C++ called OpenCV with all that information already built into it to do your own facial recognition. And then there's a wrapper library called, <coughs> excuse me, uh, something along the lines of EMVUCV. But just search for OpenCV.net and you'll find it. It is a horrible library, but it's got everything there. So you can just look at the source code, see how it does it. <coughs> the big reason why I didn't want to do that is because the actual algorithm that it uses is called Eigenfaces, which is this really, really cool algorithm. But if you don't have a degree in math like I do, you will never understand it. Okay? It, it takes, uh, there's taking liberties with math, and then there's what this routine does. Yeah. So basically, it, it takes the picture and you do some normalization on the images, and then you turn it from an array into a vector, and then you normalize it with other vectors by creating the average face and subtracting the average face from your face. I'm not kidding. And then you, and then you take all of these vectors you created, and then you calculate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of all of them, and then you do k-means pattern matching. So that's basically how it works. And if you understood any of that, come talk to me afterwards. I'll actually show you how it works. But like I said, there's lots of strange maths involved. Uh, I'm actually in the process of, and hopefully I'll have this done soon because I think it'll be really cool, uh, rewriting a code that does that in F sharp, because F sharp is made to play around with matrices like that. And instead of using the image data, using the depth data, so you can't fool it with the picture. Excellent. Yes? You mentioned normalizing. What is normalizing in the context? Um, it works best for the eigenvalues routine uh, if you actually are using bytes and all your values are between 0 and 255. So what you generally do is you take the full color picture you're getting, identify the section that's the face, so that the eyes are lined up and that you're filling about the same amount of the bounding box. You then convert the RGB values into uh, What's the other one? YUV, which is luminance, all that. Use the luminance for the grayscale version. Chroma. And then, yeah, chroma, that's what it is. Um, so basically turn it into grayscale and then normalize it so that the values, instead of being from, instead of being a 16-bit number to being an 8-bit uh, byte. So that's the normalization. And then along the way, when you start dealing with values that then blow outside of that, you renormalize it back down. <clears throat> so what I'm actually going to do with this thing <clears throat> is we're going to do some bone analysis. Because what's the nifty thing everybody sees with the demos of the Kinect that it does? It goes and it calculates your bones and it puts all the dots on the screen and you can see everybody's dots and everything's happy. And if you look, hey look, I have dots on my body. And we'll go into how I did that here in a moment. 
But so that's the cool thing everybody wants to see. And I said, well, how can we do something interesting with all that data? Because data is interesting, right? We're all geeks. Data is very interesting. Well, each one of those is supposed to be a certain point in the body. And if you think about it logically, they're connecting to bones. So there's the head, the neck, the shoulder middle, shoulder left, right. So there's a bone right there. There's the neck bone between the shoulder and the neck. And the hand bone's connected to the hip bone <laughs> through about five other points. And all these things. So we took all that data and we created, I created bones with them. And after all is said and done with the points they give you and the things that logically make sense to be bones, and there are some liberties I'm taking with what's a bone, but that's neither here nor there, um, we ended up with 24 points, or 24 bones. So what this code is going to do, and we'll slightly step through it, uh, so at this point I'm grabbing all the this is where I'm actually grabbing the connect to tell me about all the skeletons. And we're not going to, this is not a connect talk. Where I'm going through and I'm finding all those points and I'm putting all those dots on the screen. And I can have up to six people up here and they'll all have dots on them. They'll all be the same color dot, but they'll all have dots on them. The magic happens down here when I say save user data. So what this does through the call tree is it now says, all right, I found this person and I have all their dots. I'm going to go through and calculate their bone lengths based on the tracking ID. The connect, as long as it sees the same person frame after frame, will give them a unique tracking ID. So you'll always know it's that person. So every time I see somebody, and I think the refresh rate for the bones is 30 frames per second, so 30 times in a second, I'm going to get all these bones, or all these skeletal points, and I'm going to create the bones. And then I'm going to add them to this map, saying this tracking ID, I've seen this bone this many times, and this is the sum of the lengths I've seen. The beauty is that the data point that they give you for the bones is a point in three space, in meters. Guess what the origin is? This is just trivia more than anything. The color camera on the Kinect is the origin. So it's just a point in three space with a normalized entry point. So at any point in time, I can say this point in three space and this point in three space and get a Euclidean distance between it. And it's consistent because it's all from the same reference point. Awesome, right? So the only thing that's hiding in there from where I'm calculating those bone distances is, like I said, it's in meters. Name a bone on your body that's a meter long. Exactly. So I convert them. What? Uh, <laughs> So I actually convert it to millimeters, so I don't have as many problems with rounding errors. Uh, but every time I see somebody, I'm grabbing their tracking ID, and I'm saying, OK, so this bone, I've now seen it 18 times. And out of those 18 times, this is the sum total of the length. I do that so I can collect the data quicker. That's why I'm not normalizing it as I go. Because I started to write through a routine where I had the, it's this long. OK, I see it again. All right, pull it back out. I've seen it 18 times. Multiply it by 18. Add the new value. Now divide by 19. No, it just made more sense to just keep a running total and just dividing it out when I needed it. And then I go in here and I say, if I haven't seen somebody in a long enough time, I get rid of them. But then we have our actual matcher, match user. So I take some liberties with math here, but not as bad as the eigenbases routine. So we're OK. right? So I'm going to come through, and I'm going to go for between all the candidates I have and the guy that I saved as my template. First of all, I make sure that I'm not verifying that the template is himself, because that would be silly. So here's our magic loop. It's even got a comment that says it's the magic loop, because comments are important. you know. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the candidate bone length. So that's where I say, OK, for this candidate, go through, and let's just say I'm using this bone, find this point and this point, and do the division to get the average length of this bone for every time I've seen it. So I think this bone is this long, right? except for it actually gets shoulder, which is up here, and it gets elbow, which is down here. But it's normalized, right? because it's always supposedly getting the same thing. So I get that bone length, and I make sure I actually get a value, because especially when you're dealing with the clipping ranger at the feet, there are times where you just don't see somebody's feet. These things happen. I then do the same thing for the template. What is the template? 
He's just the same. He's just another guy in the map, except for he's got a very specific ID. I don't have to iterate through him. So he's just another thing. Just the way we're going to create the template is somebody's going to walk up here, which distinctly does not look like me. <laughs> and I'm going to click their, their red dots, and they're going to turn blue. And when they turn blue, that means you're now our template, and I'm analyzing your data every time. And we're going to get this nice map of them standing around and doing nothing and their skeletal structure and everything. And then they're going to walk away. And when they walk back, they'll be red again because the ID changed from the connect because they went off camera, right? So we get the template length. Then there's this guy called allowed variance. Up at the top, there's a constant, which is currently at 7%, which says the template bone length and the length threshold, actually the length threshold is 7%, I'm sorry, where I say, for me to call a bone a match, the length of the bone has to be within 7% of the length of the template, which is to say, if we're talking about this bone and it was one meter, which it's not, but if it was one meter, then the matcher would have to be within 70 millimeters of its length, give or take. So 7%. Everybody with me? All right. So that's, where, that's my allowed variance. So then I do the offset between the two and make sure I'm within the variance. And if it's close enough for government work, we'll come through and I will call that a match. Yay, that bone may be the same. I then normalize how close it was to a 4% match count, and I start adding those up per bone. So what's 24 times 4? 96, so we're missing 4% somewhere, right? I then say what that match count guy was there for. If you actually found all 24 bones successfully, then I give you the extra 0.4%, because that means, ooh, I'm kind of sure about this value. Can somebody tell me what the error in this is? Besides the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> It has to do with the fact of what comes back from the connect. Um, I may have found all 24 bones, but they may have been way off, and I just actually gave somebody a higher percentage, even though they didn't quote unquote deserve it. So I'm also rethinking about how I'm calculating bones like the palm to the tip of your finger, which can change drastically. So we're, we're, we're going to, uh, here soon I'm going to recalibrate all those. Um, anybody who wants a copy of this code who actually has a Connect 2, I have its corresponding Connect 1 version as well uh, hiding somewhere. Just send me an email and I'll mail it to you. Um, one of these days I'll get around to putting it on GitHub, I promise. But anyways, so then we do a thing. And then I have this guy called Maxis. And what it says is, is for this ID, this is the highest probability I found for you. And that's just because that there's a lot of wobble as somebody starts moving. So now it just it will slowly get more and more confident until you eventually reach the confidence threshold. In which case, I say, I have identified you, and all your dots turn green. Otherwise, then we're just going to show how sure we think we are in your study rate. Any questions? Yes? Suppose it doesn't freak out if somebody is uh, missing a limb. No, because just all those bones would be 0. And it would match against 0. I, I need to look at the way I'm actually doing it. And by that, I mean I need to look at what the actual connect value is giving you. Because I'm thinking the point it gives you isn't the, for lack of better terms, I think you're this far in the middle of the skin. It's giving you at surface depth, which then could change two people who size-wise are about the same. But let's say one is circumferentially challenged. Could cause some, some weirdness. The problem is, is what are we dealing with at this point? Millimeters. It's really hard to detect what's going on there. So it just, you know, how can I tell if I'm hitting here or I'm hitting five millimeters inside my skin? So I'd, I've been trying to get the Connect team to tell me whether it's starting to normalize inside the body or not. but. There's no way to tell. So that, that's a good question because it's hard to answer based on that. 
The idea is, though, is that hopefully you'll get the same one every time. The, the Connect 1 actually had the facial tracking stuff, where it would give you 106 points on your face. And I was doing some data normalization against that, against the parts that don't move too much, like the tip of your nose and the bottom of your ear and things like that, and was getting similar good results with that. Um, still not as good as like a true facial recognition routine, but it was actually that the same concept of saying, this distance, no matter what, is probably not going to change too much. Here, the very tip of your forehead is not going to change too much, things like that. The problem was is that there was so much data and that SDK was so finicky, it was hard to get good hits. Like I'd be standing in front of the camera and be like, find my face now. OK, I found it for a frame, now I don't. Maybe for another. So do we think this thing will work? Sure. sure. Yeah, OK. The confidence threshold on this guy is 50% because I like it when it works. And if I go much higher, it's hard for it to work. I would never use this on anything secure, but it's supposed to just open your mind about how to play around with other data. Um, I need to borrow a person who is distinctly not my size. Come on in. <laughs> All right. Sarah, are you distinctly not my size? <laughs> yeah, we should be OK right now. So we're going to run this guy. And I need you to stand over here. And it will find you. And once it finds all of you, it goes, yay! And you can move around a little bit, which is OK. Um, and I'm just going to click you. And now you are an enrolled person. How do you feel? <laughs> is it everything you ever dreamed of? <laughs> oh, I just noticed the like dots to infinity on the screen. That's kind of cool. Oh, anyways, OK, step away for a second. We've seen you plenty. Make sure you're completely off screen. And so now I can get in screen. And I'm red. And if you notice now, there's a number on top of my head. That means that compared to his enrollment, even if I move around a little bit, it's only 17% sure that I'm him. That's why you had to be distinctly not my sized. <laughs> OK? So and even if I move around stuff, I, I might be able to tweak a little higher, but it's not going to do anything. So now I can come off screen. How often were you recalculating? Were you recalculating? Every frame it's recalculating, yeah. So it wasn't changing. That's pretty impressive. Now you're going to come back in, stand there, and if you move around there, and there you go. Found you that fast. Notice, notice you're barely over 50, which is why I said how I knocked that threshold down. But so we've kind of figured out our system. Now, would I ever do this on anything secure? No. You'd be crazy to do that. How? Details. Like to narrow down a bunch of people to find a subject. But let's say I have a huge enrollment database. I can now creatively figure out which way to search it to get a match using a second form of authentication. So back to the school bus, even though we didn't do this. We bought the original Connect with the idea of doing this, but then ended up not doing it because of the, the daylight factors that we mentioned earlier. Um, as the kid walked up, I could scan their features and order the candidate list intelligently to go down to verify. So that's where you would use something like this as a, as a second factor. You can sit down now. We're, we're, we, know you're, we know you're you now. Everything's good and happy. So any questions about that one or any of the other demos? Any questions in general? What? OK. OK. Uh, I don't see why that would cause a problem. So, That is. I've used IR same night. I am I am more willing to bet that that is less to do with temperature and more to do with humidity. Um, uh, as far as the IR emitters for the palm scanner, uh, there is definitely a temperature range built into it. But I mean, 
we had this thing on a school bus talk about range of temperatures and we never had a problem with it. Um, now if you're talking about IR interference, uh, whether sun coming down was causing IR interference or maybe in, in yours it was seeing better because there was fully emitted IR during the day whereas at night it was only what it was pinging out which could be another option. Um, it could have been something like that. The, the way the connect tracks depth, and this is kind of cool, the way it did it, the, it does something similar in the current version, but the old version, this is exactly what it did. And the reason it doesn't do it this way anymore is because they were licensing the technology from some other company, I believe they were called PixelSense, and then either Google or Apple bought PixelSense. So they had to change the way they did it. But the basic idea is, is that it's got an IR admitter that shoots out a specific pattern and then it looks for that pattern to get bounced back. And the time it takes for that pixel to go out and come back is how it determines the length. That's basically what it's doing. So if you flood the area with infrared light, so all of a sudden the IR receiver is getting a direct infrared source from the sun, it goes, I can't see what I thought I was seeing because I'm being blinded by this bright light. So that's why you sometimes have problems with direct daylight. That's why if, when we first got here, uh, I was like, which way is north? So I could figure out if while I was doing this talk, the sun was going to come over in the trajectory to be pointing towards that window, which is why those two windows are closed just in case. Although with the way we were situating, it was probably fine. But that, that's the whole reason I did it that way. And that's why when we were trying to do the facial recognition thing uh, on a bus, where we had this, the connect sitting up over the driver pointing down towards the door, we could get the video feed just fine. But during the morning when the sun was directly shining down on where we were aiming it, we had too much IR interference. So we couldn't get, get any depth data from it. Well, you would know exactly what kids were stuck in the bus for you know, like a day, for example, in case of an ice storm or something. That's right. And if there was a wreck, we would know exactly who was on the bus so that we could know who to. The reason Huntsville City Schools actually asked us is because they had a problem in 2006 where there was a wreck where a Mustang cut off a school bus getting onto an on-ramp and it fell off the on-ramp three stories and crashed and four kids were killed but nobody knew who was on the bus. And parents started flipping out. So that's why they started to come up with ideas to say, hey, how can we actually gain accountability and, and real-time tracking? The other good parts about, hey, now if your kid gets off the wrong stop, we can tell you where he got off or have that kind of tracking was just an added benefit on top of, in case there's an emergency, we know who was there. And then we started building in other features like the parents could subscribe to a service so they would actually get a text message when their kid got on or off the bus. That's how we monetized the system for the school system. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, your mileage may vary. So in Huntsville, with all the rocket scientists, we get to play around with lots of really cool high-tech things because there's a lot of rocket scientists. We don't have a lot of tinfoil hat problems. And I think you all know what I mean by tinfoil hat problems. We actually have the opposite problem. There are so many PhDs, we have to present them all the white papers to prove the science works. <laughs> they have no problem with the technology. They just have to, we had to prove it worked. Um, so we were able to get away with a lot there. There was an issue in Florida where they were trying to put some other type of scanner. I don't remember which one it was. And I don't want to talk bad about somebody's device. Um, but they tried to put a biometric scanner on a bus like we were, and that project failed miserably for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. Uh, it wasn't a bus cover, was it? What? But it, it failed so miserably that the Florida state legislator said, you are no longer allowed to use biometrics with school kids anywhere, period. Have a nice day. Go away. Which really destroyed us because we had three potential contracts down in Florida, which all of a sudden evaporated because some other company messed up. So there, there's a real education issue. It depends on the school system, depends on the Department of Education in that area, depends on the Department of Transportation in that area, et cetera, et cetera, with what you can get away with. Huntsville, we get lucky that you know we have so many rocket scientists that we get to play around with things. Any other questions? Yes, I will find a place to post it. Source code, the source codes that you can have, I will give you. Um, not a lot of good giving you the palm scanner source code since none of you have palm scanners. <laughs> you can buy them from me for like 250 a pop if you really want one. We can make that happen. Uh, 
but uh, definitely the connect code and some of that other code, just so you can see that structure, I'll definitely make available. The slides I'll make available. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, Twitter feed, blog, the charity I do, go give money to my charity. Forget the fact it goes to my children's hospital, not yours. <laughs> it's the problem with doing these talks so far away. Um, any other questions, I'll be around for a while because it takes like 20 minutes to pack all this stuff up. Anyways, thank you all very much. Awesome.